it's overwhelming, but it's also our jobs. Mm -hmm. Our job is only going to get harder. It's worrisome. Well, this is something that's unprecedented. Now is not the time to be a cowboy. No one has anything to prove. We're all in this together. Welcome to Reporting from the Front Lines of a Pandemic. I'm Kayla Martin, and joining me is Steve Brown, WBUR's State House reporter. Thanks, Steve, for joining me. Well, thank you for asking me, Kayla. Of course. Uh, so my first question would be, how has your work had to adapt recently? Well, it's kind of funny because for me, I'm based out of the State House. And so I work remotely all the time. The, the state house office is a remote office. So I connect to the newsroom uh, via, you know, email, Trent, uh, not, I'm sorry, uh, email Slack. Uh, and um, I, I have a, a internet connection with a microphone. So I dial it up and it's via the internet that it sounds like I'm right in the studio, but I'm really at, at the state house. So for me, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, what is strange is I've always dealt with people who have been at the station. Now we've only got bare bones at the station. There's only one person in the newscast unit, physically in the newscast unit. All the other reporters and writers are all at their own homes. So it's, like I say, it was kind of strange for me because I'm just assuming when I'm connecting via Slack or email or messaging or anything like that, that okay everybody's back in the station but they're not they're they're scattered all over the boston area with that position of you know you're used to being in your home used to doing your work from home and now you're doing this work with people that aren't used to being from home right. what's it like in that transition period to work with people that are adjusting to this new way of working yeah it's uh it, it's a challenge again i think a lot of people have, have looked to me because i do primarily work remotely uh, that they look to me as like, oh, how do you do it? So I'll, you know, offer tips and, and what have you to, to get, them, get them through it. Uh, it is definitely an, an adjustment, but I think, uh, at least speaking for WBUR or of my colleagues, everybody seems to be doing a fabulous job making that transition and still getting the story. We, we, I think get under a, a false impression that, oh, well, we've got to be there in the newsroom to get the story. And that's not necessarily the case. You, your newsroom can be anywhere. I can, I can convert my car into a newsroom and into a studio with just the equipment that I, I carry around with me. And, um, you know, anybody, once you start learning some of that, that equipment and, and learning those applications, uh, anyone can do it. And we're finding that, uh, you know, the need to be physically all in one place doesn't necessarily have to be the case. For sure. Um, and so what's kind of been um, your job recently? I mean, it, it's all about coronavirus coverage, but how do you do that with um, like the state house perspective in that lens? Sure. Um, I, I've been, as I say, going into the state house, one of the uh, things is I'm actually loving my commute now. I live about 35 miles away from Boston. And so if I were commuting regularly during you know, rush hour, if I were to drive, and I don't always drive, I, I will take a I drive a little bit and then I'll take the T in. Uh, my commute, if I'm driving, it's about an hour and a half from my house to the state house. Uh, lots of traffic, you know, stuck on the expressway, crawling up. Uh, now it's 45 minutes. There's no traffic out there. So there's, there's a, a big difference of that. So what I've been doing is I've been primarily covering the governor's uh, daily briefing, which originally it started off, he has a, uh, there's a, the governor has access to a media briefing room down on the first floor of the state house. It's a pretty good size room, but Earlier this week, they moved it out of there and they moved it into Gardner Auditorium, which is a 600 seat auditorium in the State House. Uh, I'm sure many uh, Emerson students who've gone up there to cover things have probably covered something in Gardner Auditorium. 
Uh, so now we're, we're, we're there. So I go in for the daily briefing. Uh, I, I record it there in, in the room. And I also feed it back on a Comrex, which is a piece of equipment that uh, actually I'll bring over here. I can show it to you if I pull it out. I'll keep talking while I'm, I'm pulling it out. Uh, it's it's a, an interface that uh, connects. There's a couple of things I have to attach to it. Uh, that ba basically it's, it, it's a, attaches to a, a, a cell phone, not a cell phone like you or I would know or a smartphone or anything. There's actually there's a little dongle there that's uh, Bluetooth that connects with a um, Wi-Fi or MiFi thing that connects to a, a, a cellular system. So I'll feed back the governor's uh, news conference or briefing via that also roll on it. And I am in the room and I'm asking questions. Sometimes they're my own questions that I come up with as he's talking. Sometimes I'll go in with an idea like, gee, I want to ask him this. And a lot of times because we've got so many different reporters working on so many different angles of this story, they'll funnel me questions. Hey, ask the governor this. If you can't ask the governor that. So it, it's information that I may not be directly working on, but my colleagues are. So they want to find out what the governor's saying about that. So, you know, again, I try to, sometimes I can't get my questions in. It's uh, sometimes a free for all. Uh, there's fewer and fewer reporters there right now. They're trying to keep it down to a minimum. So I usually get two or three questions in uh, on, on every session. But that's primarily my, my uh, thing. What we wind up doing at WBUR is a reporter will be assigned. We have a reporter that will do it in the morning, and we'll have a reporter that will do it in the afternoon, which is basically what we, we do, like a five-minute long debrief. Uh, the morning one is recorded at 5.30 a.m., and then they, they record it, and if nothing changes, they, they play it again at 7.30 a.m. And then there is another live one recorded, uh, re done live at 5.30 p.m., in all things considered. So it's usually a conversation with the host, uh, Lisa Mullins. In the morning, it's Bob Oaks. So um, I've done a number of those. As a matter of fact, Tuesday was a very long day for me because of what was going on. I wound up doing the 5.30 a.m., briefing and i also wound up doing the 5 30 p.m briefing so there's a 12 hours right there plus all the prep time and everything going into it it made for a long day you know it varies sometimes they'll have other reporters uh doing that update uh the the afternoon one will have the the daily numbers that come out dph releases the numbers around four o'clock in the afternoon how many more cases of COVID-19 there are, how many deaths there are, all that, all that how, many, how many people have been tested. So we report on that. We report on the news, what the governor might have said, what the, the mayor might have said. Any other news related to that are included in those, those debriefs that uh, happen at 5.30 a.m., recorded again, played again at 7.30 a.m., and then uh, again at 5.30 p.m. Wow. Yeah. And you were talking about that. Was, that's a long day, 12 hours. Mm -hmm. um, so you also talked about the moving of different rooms into a 600 seat uh, more room. Sure. Um, and there's less amount of reporters that are going out, but are there still uh, like a decent amount of like photogs or just like amount of people there? And like, how are you doing like social distancing and that kind of aspect? Yeah, they've, they've limited that uh, up until probably a week, week and a half ago. And all the days, one other thing when you're covering something like this, all the days just blend in one thing or another. And, you know, I'm, I was looking at stuff uh, is like, well, when did that happen? It was only a, a week ago and it felt like a month and a half ago. It's, it's crazy. But uh, what they've wound up doing is they now have a pool camera for the TVs. So they do it on a rotating basis. One of the TV stations goes in, sets up, does the shot, which is of the governor and of his uh, ASL interpreter. Uh, you know, so the governor's at the podium. The ASL interpreter is uh, six feet away from him, uh, either to his left or right. And, and that's the shot. And they, they stay on that shot and, and you see it. In the past, leading up to it, maybe up to maybe a week and a half ago, it was every station sent their own camera. So we were crowded into that press conference room, which is a big room, but still smaller than the Marin Gardner Auditorium. 
they've limited it now to one reporter per media outlet. Um, in the past, sometimes the Globe would send, you know, three or four reporters up. Statehouse News Service would send in several reporters. TV stations might double up. <clears throat> they've now got it down to, to one per, per outlet. Do you think something like this will last, like even after the virus has gone and we're able to go and report in person? Um, do you think they'll keep it as a feed or do you think they'll lessen the amount of reporters that they send? Uh, they probably, they'll have to, they'll restrict, uh, they'll ease the restrictions, I'm pretty sure. Uh, at least that's my guess. But the thing about this whole story is it's all uncharted territory. Nobody knows what's going to happen. I've I've covered various big stories. I, I got sent down to Sandy Hook after the shooting there, uh, covered the marathon bombing, 9-11 uh, to a certain extent. I wasn't a field reporter at that time, but I did some of the, the aftermath at, when I worked at Channel 4 then. Uh, those stories, they're big, but you know that normalcy is, is just around the corner. This, nobody knows. Is this going to last two weeks? four weeks, a month, three months, nobody knows. And that's, and, and I don't think anybody has the answer. You know, you, you would think, well, nobody knows. Well, a good journalist will go out there and will ask the important questions and will get that answer. And this is something that, mm, no, nobody, nobody has that answer. Uh, and, and that, so that uncertainty makes it uh, kind of difficult for planning ahead. I was talking with, uh, one of the one of the state troopers on the governor's uh, security detail is saying, you know, people are never going to shake hands ever again. I don't know. Um, it was it was weird. Two weeks ago, I was out covering. It was like just you know the, the the story was just starting to percolate, but we were still covering other things. And I've been covering the cannabis beat for WBUR to a certain extent, and I got sent down to. Uh, Grove Hall down in Dorchester to cover the opening of the first uh, retail cannabis store in bought in the city within the city of Boston. So I went down and covered it. And, and I tend to when I'm when I'm interviewing someone, I go up to the introduce some, myself to somebody. I shake their hand. I say, Hi, I'm Steve Brown, WBUR. Nice to meet you. When I'm done, thank you. Oh, thank you, and, and and all that. So I was doing it that day, and and. Uh, my, one of my colleagues, uh, Robin Lovick, who's a photographer for WBUR, was down there. And afterwards, we were walking away. He says, you kept shaking hands with everybody. This is a pandemic coming on, you know. And it was like, oh. Well, and I didn't really give it a whole lot of thought at that point. And by the end of the week, it was like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to shake hands with anybody. And it was weird. Like uh, the day after, I was here at, at home. And my next door neighbor's daughter's father-in-law, so he was going way off, uh, was helping them move something. And so I was out there and, and then, you know, he you know, sh went to shake hand. I, I shook his hand. It was like, ooh, I don't know. This, this is, it's a different world now. Now, will we go back to our old ways? I don't know. Nobody knows. And talking about businesses, like, ones that are especially just opening, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, the cannabis business will be okay, I think. But, uh, you know, other things, other places, uh, they may not be able to survive. It's, uh, you know, I remember covering the, uh, there was a, a stock market crash that launched a little bit of a recession in the late 80s. And a lot of businesses closed there, but it was by no means as as broad and widespread as what's going on here. For sure. And when you were talking about, you know, like being out doing your job, being out on the street, shaking hands, talking to people, how do you keep yourself safe uh, when you're out there with everybody else? Sure. Well, right now I haven't been, I haven't been interviewing people face to face. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, there's an edict now from management at WBUR if the reporter has got to conduct an interview face to face, they got to clear it with management first. We have to, I have to call my boss and say, I'm going to, you know, Kayla is going to be here and I'm going to, going to be doing an interview with her. And they're going to ask, well, how are you going to do it? Well, I'm going to use the shotgun mic. I'm going to stand the, you know, a, a good ways away and things like that. I covered, we did that with, um, 
every Monday at the state house, uh, the governor meets with the legislative leaders, not every Monday, but most Mondays. So we had a meeting this past Monday with the Speaker of the House and the Senate President. And uh, so afterwards, the Senate President and the Speaker of the House, the governor was available earlier in the day, so he didn't take part in the, in the post-meeting uh, scrum. And so they, they had it. So we were behind velvet ropes that were probably eight to 10 feet away from the Speaker and the Senate President. They were standing probably 12 feet apart from each other. And I had to, you know, reach over as far as I could with my shotgun mic. And, um, you know, the sound was okay, a little echoey. Uh, I've since ordered on Amazon a boom mic, you know, a fish pole, I guess you can call it. It was a collapsible one. So that once we get back to doing this again, I can still keep some distance. Um, but, you know, how we will do it, I, I don't know. I hate doing telephone interviews. I always prefer doing face-to-face -face interviews, uh, even in radio. I mean, in radio, we do a lot of phone interviews anyway, but I just feel it doesn't respect the, the interviewee if they're on the phone. It just sounds like it's a call-in show or something like that. I'd much rather hear them nice and clean and clear off of my kit, off of my microphone. Uh, we've relaxed that a whole lot more. And I figured out how I can record something on, on my computer off my phone. I had, I had to figure that out. I'm sure most of the Emerson students all known that for three or four years. I've been, I'm an old guy. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all new, new to me. So I had to, had to figure that out and do some, you know, use my wife's phone and call me, call myself and see if it would work and things like that. Um, We're all learning with you too. So don't worry. It's not just you. Um, <laughs> Zoom, what we're recording on right now, just learned how to use this last week. <clears throat> yep. um, and that's a great tool, I'll tell you that. And I'll tell you one thing else that I've, I've started to do, and I, I think my coworkers appreciate it. Uh, it kind of grew up, we have a morning editorial meeting at nine o'clock. They always have the nine o'clock meeting. I never go, because I'm at the state house. I never go to that meeting. I go on Fridays. Fridays is a bigger, more formal meeting and they serve bagels. So that's the only difference. So I go uh, on Fridays because it's a good chance to get out of the state house, see my coworkers, talk with them, and, and what have you. But it, but it, there's that editorial meeting every morning at nine o'clock where they're planning out the day, what's going on, who's covering what, and, and that discussion. Now that all takes place on Zoom, and so I've been taking part in the meeting more often than so I hadn't before. Now I'm taking part in that meeting. And I was finding that I, I tend to, I'm one of these people, I always show up real early. As you know, we started this interview, I said, let's do it at two. And we really started it at, at uh, quarter or two because yeah. I was ready, you were ready. Hey, let's just do this, let's, let's go. So I tend to log on to Zoom, get it all set up. I'm, I'm usually working with two computers uh, on my desk. So I'll get one set up, check into the meeting and just sit there. And then as people pop on before the official meeting starts, you kind of shoot the breeze and find, hey, what's going on? And, you know, you, you know, all of a sudden you see, you know, your, your, your co-worker's kid run through the background and stuff like that. And you hear the dog barking and you get, you get talking like, like that. And then nine o'clock, the editor comes on. And goes, oh, we got a big agenda. Let's get right down to business. And you focus and, and you're doing your thing. But I really liked that few minutes beforehand when we were just kind of catching up and find out what's going on. So I decided I, I, I host a Zoom meeting every night at eight o'clock and it is a uh, kind of a happy hour uh, post end of the day and many people can't make it because they're still working. That's how crazy this thing is. Uh, but eight o'clock, it's like just log on. If you have a beverage with you, bring it. That's fine. That's great. And we'll just get together. We'll talk about whatever we want to talk about. There's no agenda. We talk about work. We talk about how our day went. We talk about working from home. We, you know, uh, a couple of a couple of times every so often, certain uh, of my coworkers I know play music. They play the guitar. There's one one of uh, my colleagues just you know, played the guitar and sang. And it was just a moment where we could all just go. Ah, this is kind of normal. 
and we listen to him play the music and then we talk and we laugh and, and what have you. And it's been working out and it's taking one of these uh, tools that we use to report and work and kind of just using it as a, as a way to center ourselves and get ready for the next day. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, we definitely took for granted actual like FaceTime one-on-one with like another person before this. Yeah. Um, and I think and I hated that, that by the way, I, I, I never liked faith. People go, well, it's FaceTime. No, I don't. I'm not a big, I'm not a phone guy. Uh, I like meeting people in person. Um, I'm getting used to this obviously, but you know, if my daughter was, Oh, let's FaceTime. Nah, I, I know what you look like. I was talking with my friends just the other day and we were talking about possibly having like a game night somehow on facetime yep. we're not quite sure the logistics <laughs> of that but we were going to try and discuss it and figure it out so right. there's definitely um some positive things that have come out of this for sure yeah uh, I, i'm definitely appreciating my coworkers much more uh i am so pleased that i'm a small part in this organization that is absolutely phenomenal. And I knew it was good, um, but now I'm seeing how good it really is. That's great to hear. Um, having a good work environment is always critical to having good productive work and uh, just like a happy lifestyle. Absolutely. It's been a crazy time. Um, for anybody, whether you're starting out as someone that's just graduating here in 2020, or you've been in the business for quite some time, what advice would you give to students that are just breaking into the business now? Be open to anything, try, you know, try to cover whatever you can find, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of interests as you're, as you're covering things, find, find out what you like covering and pursue that. But, but sample a little bit of everything. Uh, you got to be willing to work long hours. Uh, you got to be, you know, when, when you see an opening that you can get into, um, you know, covering some, you know, volunteer for that. Hey, I'll go cover that. I'll do that. Um, you, know, some, you know, sometimes they'll take, take advantage of you. Your management will take advantage of you. But if you're always there, always answering the bell, uh, that's going to prove you to be a valuable member of the team. And that gets appreciated. And, you know, as, as they make decisions down the road and everything, if they know that, you know, you are so reliable, you're always, you're always paying attention you know, to what's going on. Uh, that's, that's a good thing. You got to, you know, within your own mind, you got to be able to put up the walls going, okay, no, I've got to, I've got to have some me time right now. I can't do that. But, you know, on a big story like this, I remember a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> it was a Sunday afternoon. My wife had put dinner in the oven. We were going to have a very nice dinner together. And I found out that the governor was going to be holding a, uh, a briefing. And we sensed that it was going to be a big briefing uh, with some big news out of it. And it was six o'clock on a Saturday night. <clears throat> so it was four o'clock on Saturday, uh, on Sunday afternoon. I said, my wife, you're going to kill me, but I got to go. They didn't ask me to go. I just went. And that's the kind of um, approach I think young journalists just getting in need to do. Be willing, you know, yeah, I, I'll, I'll do it. I'll be there. And um you know, that that's that's a big thing i know coming right out of the gate ready to go you know like take on anything yep. so you must be one of marsh's students i am <laughs> i always thought that you know i, I never my, my father was in the marine corps uh, you know did two years in the marine corps back in the 1950s and i heard about that and, and you know the marines on the east coast they go they go to paris island and that's where they become a marine I was never a military guy. I had no interest in it at all or anything. But for journalists, Marsh's class is the equivalent of Paris Island for journalists. You go in there. It's the crucible. They're, you know, you're, you're, you're coming out of it alive. Uh, you probably know there's folks that washed out earlier because they just couldn't, couldn't deal with it. Marsh's class is 
the Paris Island for, for broadcast journalists. Welcome to the club, Kayla. I'm proud to have you uh, uh, one of us <laughs> and, uh, and everything, because I know what went into making what you are. Thank you, and it's much appreciated. Is there anything that you'd like to add that you think people should know? Hmm. That's always that's always that tough question at the end. You you were trained well, Kayla. Um, what we do is important. Uh, we get we get a lot of abuse from everybody from the president of the United States to just folks on the street that that despise the media. But a free and open media in this country is so key. So what you're doing is important work. And uh, I'll leave you with uh, something that was somebody, to, uh, a, an Episcopal priest told me when I went down to Sandy Hook for the day of the, the shootings there. Uh, I knew I had heard, you know, drove from Boston, drove down, it was like two, two and a half hour drive. And I knew that there was going to be a, um, a memorial service that night. And it was at I think the Catholic church in, um, in Sandy Hook. And I got down there and I didn't know exactly where it was going to be. And I saw a church, people were going in. I pulled over, found a parking spot, went in and realized that wasn't the church. And the, all the churches were doing something. So it, it was, this one wasn't open to the media, but I was, I, I was there. And so I, I, I get, was talking to one of the Episcopal priests that was helping out that that particular parish and I said you know I'm sorry I didn't mean to come in crash your thing I really feel bad what's happening he says no no it's okay and he talked to me a little bit and uh, uh it went on and and again I just felt horrible for being there encroaching on their their time and he said you know it's it's okay you're a first responder too and 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 in essence, we are. It's it's not um, uh, it's it's not like fighting fires or being a police officer or anything. But it's still a crucial first responder for the rest of the people to know what's going on. That's what we do. That's what you'll be doing, and and your classmates as well. So you know, realize it's important work. At the end of the day, I know that it was worth something. That's right. Thank you, Steve, for taking the time to talk with us today and continuously doing the work to keep us safe and informed. And thank all of you for watching this episode of Reporting from the Frontlines of a Pandemic. I've been talking with Steve Brown, WBOR's State House reporter, and I'm Kayla Martin.